understandest what thou readest in the King James Version? Mostly, you do. You do understand the King James. I'm sure of it. Mostly, its English is our English. It's not hard to learn thee and thou, and with only a little effort, you can learn some of the mildly more difficult words and constructions in the King James Version with a little study. But speaking of study, one of the greatest and saddest ironies of my work on the King James Version, the most ironic false friend, comes from this common objection I receive to my work that spends a lot of time explaining the difficulties posed by King James English. Ever heard of a dictionary? That's something you use to study and learn what words that you don't know mean. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God. The reason this is ironic is that the people who use this argument are being trapped by a false friend. They keep using that word study, but I don't think it means what they think it means. I've had King James Only Brothers get exasperated with my complaints that individual elements of the King James Version are no longer intelligible, and they say, and here's a direct quote, no wonder all the modern versions remove study from 2 Timothy 2.15. They think that I want the Bible to be as easy as possible so people don't have to crack open any books. They think I'm encouraging people to stop studying the Bible, which would be kind of odd coming from the editor-in-chief of Bible Study Magazine, who owns over 10,000 books in Logos Bible software, all of them dedicated to Bible study. Some of these King James-only brothers think that the modern versions are purposefully changing the Bible here in 2 Timothy 2.15 in order to cover their tracks. No doctrine is safe in the modern version. It's not the deity of Christ, not even the simple idea that Bible study is a good thing. But I insist that they are misunderstanding study in 2 Timothy 2.15. It's a false friend. Indeed, what did it mean in 1611? Our first step in the false friends process is simply noticing a possible false friend. But you won't notice this one if you don't check modern translations. The modern sense makes perfect sense in the King James in the context of 2 Timothy 2.15. But in fact, all modern translations say something different. None of them uses the word study. The two major options they reach for are be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved or do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. The King James Version appears to be telling us to hit the books while the modern versions are more general. Be diligent, do your best. Now I wanna urge my King James Only brothers to be careful here. My brothers in that world tend to fit differences like these between the modern versions and the King James into a narrative that goes like this. Once upon a time, the King James was perfectly fine, but people who wanted to soften and undermine Christianity and profit off of it came along and gave us the modern perversions. We are the remnant standing against them. But this narrative could only possibly work in this passage if the modern translations are actually contradicting the King James Version. And don't be so quick to conclude that. My concept of false friends helps show that some apparent contradictions between the King James and modern versions are due to totally reasonable misunderstandings that modern readers have when we read the Elizabethan English of the King James. Our next step is to look up the original language word in a responsible original language lexicon. Strongs and vines are not responsible. They're not terrible, but they're not reliable either. The standard Greek English dictionary is BDAC, Bauer, Donker, Arndt, and Gingrich, and it says that the Greek word being translated here with the word study in the King James means to be especially conscientious in discharging an obligation, to be zealous or eager, to take pains, to make every effort, to be conscientious. This word, BDAC tells us, is used when Paul responds to the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. They asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. It's used in Ephesians 4 when Paul tells the Ephesians to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. This word doesn't have anything necessarily to do with hitting the books, apparently. This word is more general than our modern sense of the word study, which leads to our next step. What is our modern sense? We've got to look at contemporary dictionaries to find out. And this is what they tell us study means. You know this, to apply oneself to learning, especially by reading. This kind of study surely involves diligence and effort, and I think you should do your best at it, but it's more specific than the Greek word in 2 Timothy 2.15. There are instances of this sense of the word study in the King James Version. Miles Smith warns us in the preface, and I actually found this citation through the OED, he warns us against failing to study the scriptures. For the true word nerds, I am purposefully not getting into transitive versus intransitive uses of the word study, though I could, I warn you, I could. And there's at least one use of the word study in the King James Bible text itself that is exactly the same 
same as we use it today. In this case, the context clearly indicates that we're talking about books. Ecclesiastes 12, 12, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Now that's a noun, not a verb, but same idea. In the other cases in the King James, the context is not so clear. 1 Thessalonians 4.11, study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your hands as we commanded you. This is kind of odd if study meant in 1611 what it means today. I mean, what parent of young children wouldn't be in favor of adding a subject to school? We've got math, science, history, and reading. Now we need a subject called being quiet. I would definitely vote for this. I wish my children would study to be quiet, but I'm not so sure that's what study means in this passage in the Pauline epistles. And there are other passages in the King James where I am frankly not sure without checking the Hebrew in this case what study means. Here's Proverbs 24 2. For their heart studieth destruction and their lips talk of mischief. I'd have to poke into the Hebrew to see what it means to study destruction. I did poke and it appears to mean that they devise or plot destruction. Now what I'm hypothesizing at this point in the process is that study could mean in 1611 what it means today, but that it could also mean something different. That is, it used to have more than one sense, at least two senses, and one of those senses we just don't have anymore. So we turn to step four and pull out the massive and expensive and amazing and my favorite, I'm a huge fan, Oxford English Dictionary to figure out what study means in study to show thyself approved. Now, there's nothing in the context in this verse to indicate that it means anything other than what we mean by it. In other words, hit the books. But the Greek word is suggesting that maybe what we mean by it, hitting the books, isn't what the King James translators meant by it. And what to my wondering eye should appear in the Oxford English Dictionary, but several senses of the word study, which we don't use anymore, but which fit the Greek word extremely well. Senses under Roman numeral one all have to do with striving or aiming. For example, to strive toward, to direct one's efforts to, to set one's mind on, devote oneself to. That fits the context of 2 Timothy 2.15 in the King James perfectly. Paul is telling Timothy to diligently do his best, to devote himself to and set his mind on, demonstrating himself to the Lord to be an approved workman, someone who doesn't need to be ashamed before the Lord, a Bible teacher who rightly divides the word of truth. And sure enough, the OED marks this sense as obsolete. We have a false friend. Now, I didn't find this sense in any of my contemporary dictionaries. They are not a sufficient tool for reading the King James Version well. I didn't find it in the Trinitarian Bible Society's Westminster Reference Bible either, though D.A. Waits defined the King James Bible, did explain in the margin that study in 2 Timothy 2.15 means be diligent. There's another now rare sense of study that has a slightly different nuance as reported by the Oxford English Dictionary, one of aiming more so than of striving. And for this one, the OED editors actually select an example use from the King James. Here's our study to be quiet. The OED editors are being very good biblical exegetes here because the nuance is different between that passage and the one we've been focusing on in 2 Timothy 2. You don't be diligent to be quiet, you instead make it your aim. The Greek word in that passage is different too, by the way. The one in 2 Timothy 2.15 means be diligent, set your mind, and that's the sense of study that the King James translators intended there. Now my dear mother and father are faithful watchers of my channel. Hi mom! And they both encouraged me to include Bible exposition to leave viewers not just with mind-stimulating, nerdy discussions of semantic change and translation theory, oh, and also hilariously funny jokes, but with some Bible meat to chew on as they walk away. I have good parents, and exposition is the very thing I was eager to do. I love Bible study in the modern sense. I study in the old sense to study in the new sense, and I want to obey what Paul is telling Timothy here in 2 Timothy 2. At the beginning of chapter 2 of this second letter to Timothy, Paul tells Timothy to teach faithful men what Paul has taught him. Paul uses the now classic, brilliant illustrations of the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer, all of whom have to dedicate themselves diligently to their calling if they are to succeed. But then he turns Timothy's eyes to Jesus, even if we ourselves are pretty poor soldiers, athletes, and farmers. Jesus will be faithful to us and will not deny us because he cannot deny himself. 
as we turn to the paragraph in which our key verse appears, do your best to present yourself approved. Paul tells Timothy to remind his hearers of the truths that now we've just gone over about the illustrations Paul used and about Jesus. And then he says something I've been wanting to talk about on this channel, something that honestly stops me in my tracks. Listen, charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. It's right after this that he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. I have given very serious and prayerful consideration to whether I might in fact be guilty of doing just what Paul warns against here, quarreling about words. And there have indeed been some moments when I have stopped answering a commenter in the comment section because I felt we'd gotten to that level. We were just quarreling. But what about my whole channel? Am I quarreling about words to spend so many hours preparing, shooting, editing, discussing? Is it really that big a deal if most King James readers think Elijah said, how long will you stop between two opinions instead of what he really said and what the King James translators intended, which was how long will you go limping between two opinions? Let me say clearly, no, it's not a big deal. Just like a few of my King James only brothers, I say that the best English Bible translation is the one you will actually read. And if that's the King James version, more power to you. What I'm trying to do is to give more power to you to show you things you're missing in the King James Version that you didn't realize you were missing. I have the same experience. I still have it on a regular basis. I am showing you how to rightly divide the word of truth, even the King James Version of the word of truth. I'm doing my best to help you be a diligent reader of scripture. I am also pushing back, however, against false teaching in the gentlest way I know how. Our King James only brothers have taken a very reasonable love that I share, a love for our traditional English Bible translation, and they've turned its exclusive use into a doctrine. They put it on their doctrinal statements on their church websites by the thousands. Friends, this is wrong. The Bible does not teach us to use only one translation or to expect a perfect or well nigh perfect one. Many careful Bible teachers have tried many different ways of appealing to our King James only brothers to give up this divisive doctrine, to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit with us. And most of those efforts have failed. I've become convinced that one of the big reasons those efforts have failed is that they are asking too much of our brothers and of ourselves. Textual criticism is too difficult a topic to argue about. No progress can be made there with most of my King James Only brothers because they, like most of my not King James Only brothers, have not been given the opportunity by the Lord to study Greek or Hebrew. But I think that study of English words, not quarreling about them, but study of them, can get us all somewhere. I've had a large number of younger pastors from the King James Only world tell me that my work has been helpful to them. They simply didn't realize how much they'd been missing in their King James versions. And this has enabled them to help their people too. They have not perceived me as quarreling, praise God. And I am not quarreling. I will not quarrel. Here's what I have done and by God's grace will continue to do. I will eagerly and diligently work hard doing my best to present myself to the Lord as a humble workman of whom he can approve, of a servant who is doing that which it is my duty to do. I will, by God's grace and because of the faithfulness of Jesus to me, be diligent to rightly divide the word of truth so that I need not be ashamed before the Lord. Whenever I do preach the Bible, I have a distinct sense that nothing except that Bible justifies my preaching. Who am I to say any stuff to other people? Only if God has spoken in scripture do I have a reason to preach. It galls me to consider the possibility of God saying to me after a sermon, you know, you shouldn't have said that I said that because I didn't say that. Every time my sermons misinterpret scripture or stray from the text, which I hope is never, I'm not just standing on thin ice, I'm falling through it. God help me. Rightly dividing the word of truth is a challenging but beautiful metaphor. It's not perfectly clear what Paul meant, though I think the traditional way of understanding it is basically right. It means we've got to handle God's word with care and accuracy. But BDAG, that responsible original language lexicon, suggests that the metaphor means guide the word of truth along a straight path, like a road that goes straight to its goal without being turned aside by wordy debates or impious talk. 
That last phrase is a reference to the verse that comes next, avoid irreverent babble, like those who say that the resurrection has already come. God help me and you to avoid wordy debates on a word nerdy channel. God help us all to avoid irreverent babble. I'm convinced that what I am doing is guiding the word along a straight path into your minds and hearts by clearing away obstacles that have entered that path, obstacles that come from language change. Study to show thyself approved is a pretty easy and objective false friend, but I've never met a King James only brother who would acknowledge that it is. This isn't a funny irony to me. It's a sad and even horrifying one. If I can't presume that my King James only brothers want to understand what God actually said, the way the ones that shaped me were back in high school, they wanted to understand the Bible. If I can't assume that, if I have to entertain the notion that what they really want is just to stick to tradition and stick it to me at the same time, then we can't have a discussion or a debate, only quarrels. But I'm confident that many, many, the great majority of my King James only brothers do share my desire to understand the Bible and will thank me for helping them understand what they read in the King James Version a little better.